Hey watercolor wizards, Hajra here. Today I'm doing a live stream that's going to be another one of these public, flea, uh, public <laughs> free live streams that's going to be on YouTube. And I'm just going to be doing a few different things here, so hopefully it'll be a lot of fun because I'm going to look at these brushes that I bought, talk about classes that I have coming up, and also be painting a Santa in gouache, so hopefully I can finish some of this up. So. Um, so I went and got some filberts recently because they're really good for gouache blending. So the brushes I'll be using today are going to be um, an angle and a paint around, but I'm going to show you my paints real quick too. So this is my create a color that I have out today. And this palette actually consists of a, well, you're going to use white because it's gouache for making tints as needed, but mostly there's a, a red because he's Santa. And this is a Sunblom Master Study, so it's a 1931 Santa that we're doing as a gouache master study from an oil painting that was original, but the whole point is to make it look, you know, like the oil painting. So we've got the red, we've got green in it, and um, we also have black and brown and some Indian yellow or ochre. I believe when I used this originally, it was actually this uh, color that's closer to the Indian yellow and not the yellow ochre. So that's nice because it's a more vibrant color and it'll be exciting to use that. But Funny thing is, it's still a very limited palette, so this has all of my colors out right now. But, you know, we don't actually have uh, a lot of the um, other colors being used right now. So there's not going to be any purples or blues or teals or any of the light greens. There is a little bit of green in the holly, I think, in his hat, uh, you know, but we have to sort of fix that because it's at the wrong angle. But that's pretty much it. I think there's no other green or blues or teals or purples in this piece. So that's a, a limited palette there for you. It's almost a Zorn palette, in fact. Okay, so let's move this out of the way. Yeah, I guess this is just the wrong time to come on because it seems like it's taking a while for people to filter in. But so these are the filberts that I bought. So you'll probably have to just rewatch if you get here later because I'm not gonna be going over the brushes again. But these filberts are, you know, uh, sort of have that cat's tongue rounded shape to them and sometimes I'll call them rounded flats, sometimes I'll call them filberts, sometimes I'll call them pointed filberts depending on the brand or a cat's tongue. So this one is a sable cat's tongue and it's in that filbert shape and I also got a nylon one which is a number two and it just goes to show you that like I said numbers don't really mean anything because this is a number six right here and this is a number two and the number two is actually bigger and it's at a different brand. And then I've got this one which is a number four I believe These two, of course, are also nylon and they're more narrow filberts and they're great for blending with gouache. So it's that kind of thing where you really have that assistance, you know, you can use a flat and an angle. I like those brushes too, but when it comes to sort of softer blends, you know, if you're working with gouache and such, then a filbert is hard to beat because it's sort of sensitive and how it tapers off, you know, it's got that, that shape for a reason. And you can also use a, a fan brush for effects and also a little bit of softening, but it doesn't really work as well or in the same way as it would if you were painting with oil paints. So in this case, um, you know, a filbert is the way to go. So I think the one I'm going to use today is probably have this one out because I feel like that's good for the larger blends and then also have one of these out for the smaller blends. And then I think after that I can pretty much put the other ones away. You can just put those on top of the scanner and I'll put them away later. That way I've got a section for them. And so those are the brushes that I'll be using today. And again, that's why I wanted to mention those filberts because I bought them recently, but also because most people don't know how helpful they are for uh, painting with gouache, actually. All right, so um, this is a gouache study. And the reason I'm doing it is because I'm actually doing a really big gouache class um, this weekend where we're going to be comparing four different schemes. And so I wanted to uh, talk about limited color schemes and also how we're going to do that. So we're going to be painting these foxes on ATCs. So we're going to be doing at least four of them. Um, I don't know, we might get to five, but um, we're going to be doing them on different uh, watercolor paper too. So it's going to be hot press and cold press uh, watercolor paper. We're going to do these foxes. And um, hi, Heather. Sorry, I started early because Elijah's got a meeting. And so I felt like I needed to get on here early so even though I'd scheduled it for two I had to like start earlier and it was all wrong on Instagram but you know and also in the live stream notification but here we are but um so the the complementary color schemes we'll be using this weekend for the foxes are going to be these red and green ones and what's interesting about it is I'm going to be doing um you know red and green which is the complementary color scheme for this palette for the fox so of course it's kind of obvious but um I did feel like um 
with um, watercolor and also with watercolor that has white in it. So we're going to be doing those four, four versions of the fox um, with these color schemes and the palettes done on color wheels. And so it'll be very informative for a lot of people who have sort of asked me over and over again to compare watercolor with gouache. And in this case, we're not comparing watercolor with gouache um, transparent versus opaque. I think I've done that a huge amount. And if you don't know that by now, then please go watch those older videos so you can figure out what that means. But really what's going to be informative about this is that it's going to compare how to use water color like gouache so if you're going to add white to it or use a dense watercolor or use ink tents or gouache and try to make them all look opaque you know how can you do that between these four different types of mediums in these four foxes so hopefully if you can you know have time to join me for that class that's going to be this weekend and I'm really excited about that because you know I love gouache type painting and so to try to make all four of these different scenarios make you know make them work like gouache is going to be exciting and the weekend after that we'll be doing another gouache class but this time it'll be um, effects and we're going to be doing it basically in the Zorn palette so we're going to be doing this car which is an old century old chimney sweep car and we're going to be doing it in the Zorn palette so that'll be interesting because we'll learn how to paint metal and glass and rubber and dirt for this old car but we're going to do it in the Zorn palette and gouache so that's the class after that I think it's the one weekend um, in between where there's nothing happening and then the weekend after that there's uh, that class so one class is this weekend okay so I think we've reconnected as soon as I see it buffering I just tend to stop okay so we worked on um, this class uh, this class was a live stream thing too I think I did it a few years back in 2018 so you can still go find that video um, afterward on my YouTube channel but I had done the first half of it so you can go ahead and check that out after the stream So let's get going with that before we eat up more of our time. And the colors I've got out are, like I said, the red, green, brown, and the Indian yellow. So those are the colors that we're basically going to be working with. And I'll move it a little bit more this way, but you're really not going to be able to see the whole palette on screen. So it's not really such a big deal if I guess I move it right back out of the way again. But um, if anybody wants to see a particular color, I guess I can lift them up. All right, so let's get started. And I think um, probably here um, with the white area. So this is where, again, this... Big Filbert is going to help. And I just like having a nice cushy brush for these larger areas too because, you know, it doesn't seem to um, make it easier if you have a teeny tiny brush for an area. I, I know I like to paint small, but, you know, there is there is a limit to the kind of brushes that are useful for that. So I think over here I'm going to add in a little bit of white now. And I like to do that either under or over an area where there's going to be a lot of white so I can make those tints rather comfortably. So it's kind of up to you. You can mix your tints on the paper. I do that too. Or you can mix them on the palette, um, you know, or on your paper. So it's just up to you how you get those tints. I think depending on what the area is, if obviously there's a huge amount of a tint that needs to be made, then I will mix it on my palette. If there's a smaller area with touches, then I tend to just sort of play around with it. So do you ever preserve the white of the paper with this piece? Or is it always with the white? No, there, there's definitely white of the paper showing. So like up here in his hat and stuff. You know, um, and down here, there's definitely some areas that are just the white of the paper. And then there's other areas that are um, the white of the paint mixed, you know, and also some of the, the paper. So it's a combination. I put a little bit of that uh, magenta in here. It looks rather strident, but I'm going to come back in and sort of play with it a bit to kill it off a bit. So just getting the, that little rough started. I see a little bit of a reflection in that you can go look for the 1931 Sunblom Coca-Cola Santa and you can get that image online if you want. I'm basically trying to set that up and let me get this a little bit closer. Is there a fuzzy camera situation? Does the screen look clear? Let me make sure the camera is clear. And clean the lens again. It shouldn't be fuzzy. Should be pretty clear. Does it look clear? Does it look good? Alright, so I'm putting that white down first, like I said. But I pretty much shared what I wanted to share. Now it's going to be more focusing on stuff. But is, is that all good? Is that fine? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think it should be fine. It usually doesn't have any problems with the autofocus and such. Getting a little bit more of that magenta in again. And... It's a little bit hard to see when you're putting white onto white paper what's going on, but 
it is a good buffer for putting that paint down because the last thing you want to do is put that paint on too strong and then not be able to get the stain out because you've decided to make it too dark. So trust me, it works. And we did that Lion Decker uh, muff that she was wearing, remember that at one point? And it had that muddy shadows and that white fur muff and that's how you get those you have to get those tints in there and definitely some of the bare paper can show but you definitely also want to have a little bit of that paint there to give you a little bit of cushion for blends so in this case I definitely need a little bit more of that because I don't feel like this is soft enough over here and I'm also gonna go ahead and just put a lot more of that there and then come back in with the brown and it'll give me a little bit of a cushion Just drawing on there initially, just to see where I want certain areas. Let's get that ochre wet too. I think this painting really reached uh, the limit of how many colors I like to have out. I like to have no more than six colors out, and this definitely got to that point where there was six uh, colors out for sure. The other thing you can do before you get onto a live stream for people who <laughs> would consider live streams is that you could definitely warm up a bit before you get started. I mean, for me, it's not such an issue because I've been doing this for a long time, but you know, you can definitely set yourself up to be ha having a little bit more of that. See how that's sort of uh, breeding more as white now? And white with some shadows on it. Now he is having like an overblown shadow coming in from the outside of the door there. So that's totally dark, you know, and it looks more dark now because he's on a white background. But that is how I want it to read because I do not want to have different colors than in the study. And you could definitely make it lighter if you feel like it's going to read better for you in some ways. And I don't really want it to be lighter. I tried that higher up with the beard where we had blown those out and then we came back in and darkened them all back up again. So in this case, I'm going to learn from my last time I was working on this and say, nope, it ended up being exactly the colors we wanted. So I'm not going to mess with that. But you see how it starts to give you that oil painting look once it gets to that saturated part. And that's definitely something I'm going to be covering in the class this weekend, which is that how do you make your gouache paint look like oil, right? So step by step, how do we make that look like oil? Because, you know, you can paint with watercolor and it looks great and luminous. And I don't want to make my gouache do the same thing. I don't like to use my gouache transparently. I like to use it so that it looks like oil, you know, preferably oil and, you know, sort of like the best types of acrylic paintings, but definitely on the side of oil because it's such a luxuriant, rich, decadent look. Do you have anything to say? Kat's here. She says Merry Christmas. Christmas and July. I think it's that time of year in Australia. I think. Well, I know it's time Santa to sleep in Australia. I don't know what she's doing up. Cat, aren't you supposed to be asleep? <laughs> but worried about your sleep. Okay. Cat says she's freezing. She's freezing? Well, it is winter over there. Yeah, it's just, it's hard to imagine. It's hard it for is. me to imagine. I'm such a northern hemisphere biased person because I just can't figure out how to feel that way in uh, July over here. Okay, so that's definitely going towards that. It looks like it might be too dark, and then it's actually not. So that's what I was saying to people before, which is that this is white, and white just does have really dark shadows on it. Just let them happen. They actually happen that way. It's, you might think that white can't have such dark shadows, it does, or such multicolored shadows, it does. <laughs> so just let it happen that way. Okay, but that looks very much like uh, what I want it to look like, which is like I said, that oily oil painting look. And you get those velvety colors as soon as you go nice and opaque and get that control and just draw with your paint like you would with a pencil. Don't treat your paint like it's out of control washy. That's good for effects in the background and such, but it's not good for doing realism with gouache. Okay, so if you're going to be working in watercolor and doing those kinds of realistic effects and, you know, you're going to have to cut down on the looseness of the watercolor too. So you have a time and place for the looseness of things and then other times you just have this 
controlled way of applying your paint, okay? That ha has to happen in all of your paintings, basically, unless you're doing fully abstract work. And just softening up these edges here. See again how that filbert makes easy work for that? So I just went and bought five filberts from Lens Arts uh, over the weekend. And I just wanted to get a few filberts. I was looking through my drawer and I was like, why do I only have one filbert? I think I had like two total and I looked through all of my stuff, including like ones that I hadn't, one that I hadn't gotten out and that was it. And I was like, I need these filberts. And I guess it's because I just must that many filberts. So I fixed that. Okay, so that's that part of it. And do you want me to try this one or let's see if that does anything? Does that over or underexpose? Is that fine? I don't think it makes it much of a difference. Heather says she needs to get more filberts and a rake brush. What does she use the rake brush for? I was about to ask you what you use the rake brush for. No, it's for effects. It's another one of those things that has like a little bit of a, kind of like a mix between a fan and a filbert that's got like a scalloped edge to it, like a ziggy one, at least the ones that I know about, unless she's talking about something different. All right, so coming down to here and getting to the uh, the red. Kat says she's never used a filbert. Never used a filbert? Well, you better get a, at least a filbert or two if you're going to be working in that gouache class. Uh, I don't know if you're there for the class this weekend, but... I mean, you can always use an angle or a flat too, but you know, like here's my angle and I'm gonna make it work, but. Now I did this two years ago, so um, I'm trying to remember which red I used. <laughs> I can go back to the video, but I'm pretty sure I'm not um, sure even in the video what, what uh, red I used. So I'm just, I'm assuming it's like close to what the cadmium or the vermilion was for the gouache set. So, you know, the gouache doesn't label it. So um, this is one of those paintings that I unfortunately did not create a color wheel for. So it just means that when you come back to finish it later, you have to guess uh, what colors you had out. So I did go back and watch the video before, um, you know, the stream to try to figure out what colors I had out. So I think I figured most of them out. I don't know exactly which red I used, but I think this is pretty much the red I used. So I think it's okay. So again, now I'm gonna try to draw all of this in. And I think I used brown shadows from what I remember. Now, if it starts to look like it's a different mood at the top and the bottom, it's because I have screwed up the colors um, and made them different. But that's kind of the, the risk of coming back two years later to paint something. I went and looked at that. You know, it's funny. Um, when we were doing this live stream, apparently that was the last painting I did in 2018. That's what I was saying in the video. I was saying this is my last painting for 2018 and also the last painting before I moved to um, another city. So... Now we're finally getting it done a year and a half after that, almost two years after. Isn't that nuts? It really is. Okay, so trying to get that. And again, I'm trying to do these tiles, right? So this is tiling. If you want to know what that is, you can watch one of my other videos. And uh, you can watch me do this right now, too. Obviously, I'm going to be doing live tiling, but it's these little jigsaw pieces. And I teach it step by step in uh, the line decker class, too, that we did. We did different types of tiling and tiles that you can have, so... Again, all, all there if you want that as something to be interested in. By the way, I think I said this last time too, but just in case you weren't here, probably not here this time either. <laughs> but, but I have turned the comments off on my channel because um, I'm not interested in uh, you know doing this with too much more of my time. I've got so much other stuff to do and this really eats into my time. So I've turned the comments off. Um, you can still leave comments on the community page. You can still comment during live streams, of course, and uh, premieres and all that. So whenever I do those, you can do that, but I'm just going to be doing it, you know, much more occasionally and sort of semi-retiring my channel because I really have to um, focus on other things, you know, focus on other things. It's just not uh, possible to do a thousand things at the same time and for people who are like, oh, you should run your YouTube channel and do all your other things at the same time. It's like, nah, I can't. I have other things that are pressing priorities as well, so. So that's that part of it. Is everything else going fine? I guess there's not much to check on because there's a, a really teeny audience right now. All right, so let's see. I'm going to go ahead and put the brown there again. I've always found um, any kind of gouache master study to be a lot of fun. I think it sort of lets you feel like you're still drawing in pencil, and I think it's because it's more um, correctable, like, you know, over and over again than watercolor. I mean, I don't actually feel stressed out about watercolor either because I feel like watercolor is to an extent correctable as well. You can sort of lift and correct. It's not as um, unforgiving as... Than that. 
So I think that that's one of the reasons why it just feels like it's easier to deal with. But on the other hand, I have noticed that you sort of put a watercolor down and the glaze and stuff and you can layer over it and it's sort of kind of a stain that sinks in, right? But when it comes to um, gouache, you can actually come back and scoot something over and totally lose it. And in that way, you can actually mess it up in a way that you can't mess up watercolor. You see what I'm saying? So it's actually a mixed bag. You know, sometimes things will be, you know, more easy in watercolor and sometimes will be easier in gouache. So it all depends. Layers are definitely easier in watercolor. Gouache is not a, a layer friendly medium. All right, so let me take my bigger brush again, get some of that ochre, and I think we'll work on his boots now. I can, I think I've lost most of the drawing down here too. Like, I don't even know what's going on with the drawing down here. It's like been here for so long that I don't remember what I was drawing. You know, that's kind of just what happens when you let stuff go for a long time. And is this a technique that you want to teach people to not paint something for two years? It's a real... Yeah, it's like, a, does it help you learn certain things about painting? Yeah, it helps you learn that you will not remember what you were doing if you just decide to forget about doing something for a long time. <laughs> you don't know. Um, I think I did that for what was the other piece we were working on? I forgot where I was like, I don't remember the colors and what we used for it. It was another... The gnome lady? No, no, we haven't even worked on that yet. Yeah, that's going to be another problem in itself because it's also going to be a piece where I forgot the colors, but... This is, uh, there was another piece that we were working on recently that we were trying to finish up and it was from an older thing and I was telling you, it was like, I can't remember th what I drew here or I can't remember what the uh, colors were that I had out. So, you know, it's just a few complications that happened. So he's got like this big wide, you know, it's not very attractive as a boot. So you don't have to actually worry about it. It's not like some dainty lady slipper. It's going to be easier to draw in with the paint and take less time and attention than it would say if it had been something way more complicated. So let's go ahead and start throwing some of the, the details in. And I can do that with probably a smaller brush than this once I get past the uh, the top part of the boot. I'm gonna come back to, the, and the reason I'm saying that is you guys have already seen me do some of the white up there on the trim, and I think that'll get boring, so I'm gonna work on the boot instead. And hopefully we can get to that bag of gifts in the back, and that'll be a little bit more interesting as well. But right now I'm just trying to sketch out uh, in my paint just what it was that, you know, I felt like the boot should look like before we move on. And again, try to get it on the tiptoe of the uh, the filbert here because it's not exactly going to be the teeniest brush. But like I was saying earlier, this isn't um, the most dainty Cinderella slipper, so it's not really such a big deal. You can always come back and uh, tweak the details after the stream as well. Never going to do your best work live whether you're a student or a teacher, so no reason to put that kind of pressure on yourself. This is just blending right off into the shadow onto the side, so this is just going to just keep going to over here. And same thing for underneath this boot, so I can put in a tile stain, so I'm not really interested in using gouache uh, translucent, but that's what happens when you use it um, translucent. Is it sort of pebbles on the paper a bit more than a uh, then watercolor will. And let me rinse it out so I can get a finer. Cat have a question there? Is Filbert a cat's tongue? Yes, some people call Filbert's cat's tongues. Um, there's not that much of a difference. Sometimes cat's tongues can be slightly more sort of full bellied or pointed, but I haven't noticed any discernible differences between different brands, you know? So a cat's tongue, a Filbert, um, sometimes a, a rounded oval wash, they all sort of look, you know, look kind of the same. So this one, I forgot what this is called. I think this might not be called a filbert. It might just be called an oval wash, but it is a filbert, you know? And same thing for this one. This is called a filbert on the barrel. It's called a filbert, and it just looks like, you know, a cat's tongue. And then there's another one that I have that's called a cat's tongue. So yeah, they're all kind of overlappy with each other like that. So I'm using the ochre on one brush, and so now I've got, typically with gouache, I usually have paint on both brushes, so. Yeah, well, it's just like the color brands, too, where you end up having a brand where you're sort of saying, okay, well, what is this color? And then they've come up with these whimsical colors, right? And you're like, that whimsical color is not really a color, you know, like as far as paint pigments grow, you know, there's not like some of those colors are, are definitely just made up. So this is a, a darker brown, and it fades more in towards a red. So one of the things you can do is come back in with the ochre and give it a bit more life and also a bit more red. So I can mix a little bit of red into this brown because there are definitely areas of this brown 
that I feel like aren't as lively as they should be. So I'm going to go ahead and add a little bit of red right on my palette to the brown area and make it into a browner red or a redder brown, however you want to look at it. And that'll give me a prettier brown when I come down on the paper. See, like that. And it harmonizes better with the coat up there, but also it'll give me a chance to spread this out and get a few more temperature differentiation zones here because you don't want it to all be the exact same brown temperature. You know, you want to vary it as much as you can. I'm going to carve out some of that here. So let's do some of that carving with the, uh, the darker brown first and then I'll come back in and variegate it. I have always found that it's actually easier to put in what stands out to me as the darker tiles first. Um, you know, it doesn't always work because obviously you have to go around it and it'll smear and blend. So it's up to you how you do that. You can actually work from lighter to darker tiles as well or mid-tone method, which is doing the mid-tone first then coming back over the top with the darkest and then coming back over the top after that with the highlights. It's also a very popular way to work. So it's kind of what I'm doing here because the mid-tone is kind of the ochre on the bottom of that boot and then now I'm coming in with the darker and I'm going to come back in and really punch in the highlights, right? So it's kind of like mid-tone method combined with tiling. It might be easier to do adjacent tiles like that if you had markers or something, right? But because you have paint on a brush and you have to like rinse it out and come back and rinse it out and come back, it's probably better to sort of consolidate some of those zones. So that's definitely how I do it is I don't I try to figure out similar colors at the same time and then come back. Now this part down here is definitely capturing a big highlight at the top of the boot. So I'm going to try to demarcate that by putting the darker area here and then going back towards that area. So again, we're just having to draw this in with the paint because God knows what happened to the stupid pencil drawing beneath here. So I'm just going to put in the tiles. And the nice thing about putting in the tiles with paint is that when you come back to uh, work on them, you can just um, damp edge blend them and they will turn into uh, softer tiles. So I don't actually have to soften these tiles up right now. It's not like watercolor where if you don't soften it as it's going down, same thing for acrylic or ink tents, then you know, you've kind of missed your chance um, unless you layer over it with something opaque, which is kind of against the, the look of, you know, what you might be trying to achieve in a transparent watercolor. You don't have any witticisms today? I think I used them all up on a Santa Claus in July. You didn't even come up with that. I know. And it's not that witty. It's really not. Right. <laughs> all right, and coming back up here. If he's a magical elf, why does he need such warm clothing? Is it just for show? Um, you know, was it your opinion that he was a magical elf? For me, I Isn't felt like... one of those songs? Doesn't they call him a, an elf? I know, but I thought he was a saint. You know, like, to me, he was Saint Nicholas, right? So, like, I mean, he's still... Well, like any of those saints who have magic power. A, a bit of an unreconstructed so, so, so what age? So what age did you stop believing that Santa was going to come down the tree? Oh, well, my parents never told us that Santa was real. They told what? Us the beginning you got ripped that. off. You got, you got a crappy child. <laughs> That's right. At least I didn't live a lie. I didn't see the scales fall from my eyes and say everything you've shown me is a oh, lie. Oh, come on. It didn't ruin my life. I just had fun. And, you know, and like I said, for all you know, if you're really for good, all you know, for all you know, if you're really good, really he might Santa still Claus. show up. Yeah, exactly. So sure. how, do, how do you know? That's a good question. Yeah, you know, I remember when my mom broke my sister's heart by pretending she was the tooth fairy. I think I told you this before. I can't remember if we talked about it you on did, a stream or not. I don't think you've talked about it to the world. <laughs> Yeah, my sister was totally heartbroken. She was like, she thought the, the tooth fairy actually existed. And turned out that it was just my mom. What? Yeah. It was? Yeah. It wasn't a real tooth fairy? No, it was Oh my gosh. <laughs> so my sister was totally traumatized. She was like, I thought, I thought those letters were from the tooth fairy. I thought the money was from the tooth fairy. What kind of tooth fairy did you have there sending you letters? Yeah, my, correspondence. And I guess my sister also didn't think to herself, I wonder where this tooth fairy has my mother's handwriting. 
because you know looking back on it you know well we were all there i know if you know fatima was the oldest but we were all there we all could have said hey this this looks like mom's handwriting doesn't it i mean like what she writes when we don't go to school and it's you know we're late and you're saying you know so you know your mom's handwriting because you're like half the time trying to like sometimes use it to get a a sick note this is getting even worse (laughs) wow oh i i did have a actual sick days and my mom actually was one of these people that said you just have my permission to write a note on my behalf so i wasn't exactly doing it behind my mom's back or anything like that were you writing any um tooth fairy notes to your sister behind your mom's back tooth fairy no no i was not (laughs) that wasn't me i wasn't smart enough to figure out that i could really play my sister like that so cat's saying that he was a saint his gift was a dowry so poor girls could marry if i recall correctly saint nicholas I mean, he's not exactly... But you're not painting. You can look it up, can't you? I'll look it up. Here we go. This is going to turn into a very different kind of live stream. Well, I mean, there's that... When when you're painting a boot, it's okay to talk about something else. I've already said how I was painting the boot. Yeah, I've said it in detail how I'm painting the boot. So, if you you know, we can talk about other stuff apart from the painting. Yeah, he's from Mira, which is the southern end of Turkey, which is not the kind of climate where you wear warm fur lined well suits. but yeah but they do the same thing with him that they do he also with, does like... not look like a, a very rotund individual he looks like a very thoughtful eastern well they used Orthodox to we used to gentleman. before um uh jc Leindecker drew him in red clothes he didn't have a red costume so before we'll sunblom this is this is Haddon sunblom santa that he did for coca-cola in 1931 and moving forward but before this jc Leindecker, joseph christian Leindecker. Um, was drawing Santa, and he's the one who made him more iconic in the in the white in the red costume, and also to make him um, a jovial guy with you know uh, a fat dude with big cheeks and all that stuff. So that's all from J.C. Leindecker. I so mean, one of Saint Nicholas's miracles is that he resurrected some pickled children that a butcher killed and pickled. Oh, I think I remember that story actually. Yeah. Yeah, I remember that story. But yeah, so he's uh, what we come to think of as sort of like the iconic Santa didn't end up happening until after uh, J.C. Leindecker, you know? And Haddon Sunblom then sort of accentuated that. But now I've got like three brushes going. I've got to put one of them down. And so I've kind of lost um, that line in the center of that area right there. And instead of coming back and lifting it out like I would with watercolor, you can just come back in with white and drop it in, right? So that's one of the nice things about having gouache is that you can go ahead and do that so let's see like right there it's a little teeny line so it's not like it's a a big line but you know it means something to me and i'm going to come back in and uh put uh ochre over it later to carve it further so the gouache is you know you don't want to leave that cool cool white there but you do want to put the the yellow over the top of the white because it's not going to be um, powerful enough to sort of be clean over the brown, you know? Okay, let's get uh, my filbert back out. This seems like a giant filbert, but it does a good job for, you know, when you're coming up to these edges and softening stuff out, so it's good for that. I mean, just keep it damp with not that much liquid in it. Do you, do you have any more comments on there? I think I saw something pop sure, up. Sure, take a look. I'm sorry, I was reading about St. Nicholas. He did very little present delivering. Cat wants to know why was the tooth fairy writing? So does Heather. Heather wants to know too. Oh, she was writing a note to my sister saying that my sister was a really good girl. And as a result of that, the tooth fairy was visiting her. And my sister, like, legit, I mean, my sister's going to watch this live stream and be really pissed off at me (laughs) for sharing all this stuff. But my sister was, like, for real tearing up and, like, she was really emotionally moved by the fact that the Tooth Fairy deigned to write to her, you know. She visited a lot of kids, but she only wrote to my sister, so my right. sister was very moved, you know. Right. She considered it to be a great sort of uh, indication that she was special. <laughs> and yes, Kat, at least according to Wikipedia, he's from Mira in Turkey, which I suppose gets cold, but it's on the Mediterranean coast, so it can't get that cold. After all, it is a Mediterranean climate. Yeah. So, you should be wearing olive leaves and um, hummus. Well, like I said, they do that with a lot of things that come from the Middle East, right? Jesus is also from the Middle East, right? So, he's not exactly blonde-haired and blue-eyed. So. What? Yep. He's not? I know. Blonde-haired and blue-eyed? Breakthrough. 
controversial. All right, so we've got that, and I like the red clothes and the jolly. I mean, actually like some very elven or also like super mm -hmm. skinny and stuff. I think this is to me a more trust trustworthy looking Santa. You know, right, like he it, can't he can't really shift around on you. He can't really move too quickly. Well, right. I mean, but if you had a Saint Nicholas, right? If you had a Saint Nicholas and he existed someplace, wouldn't you want him to look like this more than you would want him to look like some kind of, you know, more creepy, um, you know, fey type of looking person, you know? Because cause like I said, it's not that there's anything wrong with somebody looking fey in that way, but it just for this type of, uh, I mean, what he became, you know, sort of like the institutionalized commercial version of him had to be like this really nice, safe and likable, you know, more generally appealing. So if he existed in, in real life someplace, who knows what he actually looked like, right? But there you go, that boot's turning out okay. It's an okay boot, if I should say so myself. It's good. Well, at least for right now, yeah. For right I mean, now. For a boot. Yeah, for right now. <laughs> Are you just Canadian today? I think, I'll, I... I'll think about it. You'll think about it? I think I, there's, I, don't, I can't remember if I was saying, oh yeah, I was saying free earlier, and I said flee instead, so. I, I can't ever say words on live streams, like, especially the ones that I know I can't edit. Like, this is the one that, like, it's going to be left up, and it's not going to be edited later. So inevitably, of course, the, the words have to end up all sorts of crappy in this one, right? Like, I'm saying all sorts of stupid things. Well, right. it's good that you're making it better now, by drawing attention to it and continuing it. Oh, well, if I don't, somebody will just call me on it later. Um, I think I said long, uh, long story short, uh, or, and then I said something different, right? And Paul called me on, he was like, hey, did you say that? I was like, yeah, thanks for bringing it up in the comments and making fun of me with all those laughing faces, but I would do it to him too, so. <laughs> if you were doing live streams and messing up on words, I'd probably bring it up to you too, so I guess I have to have that sense of humor for other people as well. If I didn't know the now I'm gonna to try to try to dry brush along the edge here. So I'm gonna like really let this dry off a bit up here and then scrape the dry brush version of it along here because it'll give me that shadow. A large part of working with uh gouache is knowing when and where to pull those dry brush strokes. We did them before for the uh higher up part of the Santa and you know you wanna be able to pull those pebbly sort of shadows. really is a, a great way to sort of enjoy painting with oil without any of the fumes, right? Because this is like, to me, I, be, I bet this is close to what water-soluble oil feels like, except for even that's going to be more hassle to clean up. Now, of course, it dries waterproof, so there is that trade-off if you get water-soluble oil or regular oil. I mean, it's not truly waterproof. No paint really is. It's water-resistant, so you can't, like, you know, dunk it in a tub of water and leave it there overnight. But you know, it's it's pretty close to waterproof, um, is for all intents and purposes, unless you're on the Titanic, in which case your painting's not going to last. Um, all right, so I'm going to come down around this side. It's got some strange shadows in the back there, too. Um, I think the way that uh, old Haddon Sunblom drew him back, back there, it looks almost like he's got an ankle cast. I mean, is it just me, or is that just getting, like, super wide in the back there? Like, it's like a really, really wide... He's a big guy. He needs big ankles to hold up all that weight. Well, I'm assuming as it recedes into the background there, though, that it would be less, uh, should be less, less thick in the background there. So instead his ankle's gotten thicker. So I don't know what his goal was to make it look that, quite that thick. Maybe he has diabetes and his feet are swelling as a result. So he's put on a nice, happy face, <laughs> but all those cookies are finally getting to him. You know, I... I have a feeling that there's, I'm so glad that this is like no longer approved for kids because you totally ruin this for kids if this is like a video that some right. There is well, no I mean, Santa Claus and if there was, he has diabetes. You actually don't know that. You really what? don't. There is no Santa yeah, Claus? Yeah, you really don't. I there might have been somebody that existed. Well, I just looked it up. There's no Santa Claus. I mean, like you don't think it's that. confirmed. St. Nicholas, he was a historical figure. Right. So how do you know he's not Anything like this? operating in some capacity? Yes. <laughs> because, because they have his finger bone in one part of Greece, and they have some other bones of him in another part. They do, for real? So if he is, then he maybe that's why he wears that glove. Maybe he's missing a couple of fingers. This has gotten so dark. Mm -hmm. You know how they love no, do they really... saints with their little saint bones. Do they really have? Do they yeah, really yeah, have the yeah, finger... Yeah. Left those finger bones there. 
Do you as see a what, present. Okay, while, <laughs> while you were talking about Santa's poor finger bones, you do understand that I'm making this into darker shadow back here, right? Sure, yeah, let's get back to the important stuff now. Which is that I took Which some... Which fingers do you think it was? <laughs> well, if I... If I had, Santa's finger when bones. It, whenever they talk about finger bones, it's always a pointer finger, isn't it? Like in a story and such? I think when it comes to veneration of saints, and I don't know for sure, I think that they weren't like, it was a beggars can't be choosy kind of thing, right? Like they take whatever bones they could find. Oh, well. The finger bones were just very portable. I don't know, though. It's a really interesting question. Do you see coming back up here and making it even darker? Because this has uh, got to be darker in order to really pull the weight of that shadow that it's connecting from the boot. So uh, um, a boot, the boot is down here, is connecting from this boot to this boot, and it's going up into the leg there. And it's sort of that uh, consolidating shapes, right? So merging shadow shapes and turning them into a giant shape will make it more attractive as a silhouette versus having all these things separate. So um, might be a conscious or subconscious uh, layout decision on his part, but we do know that it works quite well, so. Don't shake that table too much with your typing. Okay, and I'm just gonna disturb that just a bit to give it a little bit of that fluffy fluff texture. Fluffy fluff texture. Yeah. This is so not at all how I imagined Heather wants to know this. why... Could either could tell age better than a finger. I don't know, maybe because it was more portable. Probably just the portability aspect of it there. I don't know. Maybe he gave his spine to poor children. Okay, you need to stop talking about that. Talk about something else. That's not related to Santa Claus? What? That's not, no, you can, it should be related to Santa Claus. <laughs> Somehow, but as long as well, it's not lately about, he's been drinking as long a lot of Coca Cola, we know that, right? Been drinking a lot of Coca Cola. That probably did not help with this uh, edema with his, of the ankle with here. <laughs> <laughs> with the swollen ankle situation here, yeah, maybe uh, cut back on that. I think his, based on the blood test, because you know my sister's a doctor, so we know it was, sure. he's definitely got a six point five or right, higher. Right, he's pre pre <laughs> diabetic. He's one of those people that probably puts off getting his blood tech checked, though. I'm right, as sure. long as they don't tell him he has diabetes, he doesn't have diabetes. So right. That's how it works. So it works for a lot of people. And they're like, I'm just not going to go in and get this checked. And then, magically... So I'm using that filbert. Like I was telling you, I might use like a, a fan brush, right? So here goes. I'm blending off some of those edges. All right. I think that's kind of done done for on that side and I'm gonna come back and disturb uh, this edge a bit too just to it's kind of silhouetted in the doorway so we don't have to worry about that because we're not doing a doorway but I don't want it to be uh, totally hard on that side because it just you know wouldn't read right based off of how everything we're doing so probably gonna have to come back around for the whole piece and knock down some of these edges in places All isn't right. that supposed to be white what is that part that you have there in the shadow. That I missed? No, I'm talking about the white on his right boot. There is a white fur line top to the boot. Isn't there supposed to be a white fur line top to the right boot? Right there. It's right there. Okay. But it's receded into shadow. Oh, okay. So it's okay. like Excellent. what they've done is they've sort of, you know, mi mixed it into the the boot part here and, you know. Okay. All right. So now let's get the, I think I've got, I can't tell what color I have on here now. It's brown. Okay. Let's get the light ochre color and then the brown shadow so let's do that again on this side again we sort of had to draw up this boot and I'll have to do the same thing because I don't know what I drew here a long time ago this is like two and a half years ago plus it's been knocking around my drawer plus I pulled it out a few times as a result of that the pencil lines are all faded so um, I don't know I have no idea what the drawing was underneath here so it was meant to help me draw this and now it's gone so maybe take Better care not to rub all your pencil lines out if you're trying to paint something in the future that you're, you know, not finishing. So, um, luckily I can just sort of, uh, draw this in with the paint and not care that it would be more stressful if I definitely ended up, you know, if it was like a time where I felt like I couldn't draw with the paint, 
which was like many, many years ago. So luckily I'm not at that stage now, but don't lose your pencil lines if you can't draw with your paint. I just saw you have three brushes at once and they say you're a wizard. I said you're a wizard, Harry. <laughs> I do have a, uh, you know, an initial that starts with H. So I was when I was younger and re reading those books, I always used to get the, I had a jacket. From the H? Just from the age. Yeah, just from the age because it's Hogwarts and it's Harry, right, and everything. Hogwarts, Harry. Well, I'm and saying Hogwarts. this right now, and I and, uh, and you know, and it's, it makes me sound like really stupid. But did your mother write you a letter? In did did Harry Potter write you a letter in your mother's handwriting at any point? No, no, he did. <laughs> <laughs> I do have a Harry Potter throw sitting right there. Uh -huh. It's from the Fantastic Beasts, and I've got Harry Potter bed sheets. You Ooh, know that? You. Yeah, I do. I know. It's it's. I know. I. Book. It is. It is a very good book. Okay, so I mean, it's more than one book, right? Like, it's seven. two or three books? Seven books. And eight movies, right? I think it was eight it's movies. a lot of movies. It's a lot of money. That's why they made them. I'm surprised they haven't remade them yet. They probably will. You know, like as a prestige series on HBO or Netflix or something. Yeah, but nobody's going to want to do them now. I'm going to add a little bit more red to my brown here. It's doing the same thing that we did on the other side, which is that, you know, that brown doesn't have enough heat in it. So, you know, in order to get that sort of multi-dimensional... shadow looks great. Which shadow? The shadow onto the other boot. Oh, that's because uh, I told you I did those uh, dry brush edges there. Remember I said that and if you do that, it really puddles off. It pebbles off in a really nice way. Yeah. So that's uh, definitely... What you want to do, I'm adding more red to this brown. Again, it harmonizes with the rest of it, but also keeps that brown from being um, just too dead there, right? So you can get a little bit more color variation. And when you're doing this in the initial stages, this happens with any painting, it's that when you do the drawing with the paint, it'll look like crap for a little bit. You know, this is going to be the ugly stage because there is no pencil here underneath it because, you know, like I said, we sort of lost it um, a few years ago with this drawing sitting around and fading. But if you can draw with the paint, then you just make those corrections, right? So I'm going to continue to come back in and make those corrections and sort of shape this paint in. And so I've got this part right here. And fade it all out. And it just gives you a nice texture. There's so much fun with textures. I know it's not wet and wet, but there's so much fun in textures that you can do with dry brush and sort of scraping... Um, stuff around with gouache that you can't do with a uh, watercolor because it's just not opaque enough. I mean, you can, to a certain extent, do um, dry brush textures, of course, with uh, watercolor, and I have, but it's different. It's different than doing the gouache. And they'll also look very... I guess I should move on to the bag of presents instead of finishing off this boot. What do you think? You can finish the boot off. Finish the boot off first. I mean, you're not going to work on it again for another two years, right? So, <laughs> well, I'm hoping to just finish this off this time and not have it sit around forever because otherwise it'll just be. That would probably be better. Yeah, it would be better. And All then right. we can start to take his little finger bones. He doesn't have any finger bones for you to take. He's he's a safe and guarded Santa. He's my Santa. You're not allowed I'll to touch him. I'll cut off little pieces of this and ship them out. Okay, well, that I'm going to send this painting to somebody else that loves me and my Santas in that way. I mean, what is what shows love more than veneration of, of fingers? I don't want to talk about the finger bones again. Do not go back to that topic. Okay, let's see. This is what happens when I don't have a more, um, you know, exact thing to talk about. So we end up talking about the weirdest things. <laughs> well, I mean, it is Santa Claus, so that is a part of his story. Okay, I think that this part of it is not um, round enough, and that other part of it is too pointy. So I've got to try to figure out where here. I actually don't mind that shape, actually, so I think I might just go around it. And put in the shadow and call it a day, actually, and then come back in and polish it off. I think I'm going to have to sort of work on a few of these shadows around sure. here, right? So I'm going to come back in and work on a few of these shadows. So, But I'm not going to do that right now. I'm going to do the bag of presents so there's more interesting things to see. But yeah, we'll be using, we'll be doing, you know, four different opaque paintings on this Saturday. So if you want to join that for just $15, you know, that class is there. 
And I kind of like the point on his boot. I don't really know how it's uh, blending off into Noever land on the left there, um, to the shadow. But I think that putting a little bit of the shadow underneath gravity acting upon him in that area. Because, you know, we're not doing a background, so I don't want it to look like he's just sort of floating, right? So do a little bit of that and fade it off over to the left. Maria Kellner says, hi from Sydney, Australia. Caught the live. It's nice to see her, Maria. I haven't seen you in a while. And yeah, it's because I'm on so sporadically. All right, so let's get over to this side. Um, I do want to maybe feather this out a bit more. And then up here, we're going to come back in and, like I said, come back and add some of this detail and uh, bring up the values how I'd like. But I'm actually pretty happy with most of that. Over here, I can do a little bit more of that dry brush to give a little bit of that shadow here while I'm here. This is the best time to do it is when your paint is a bit dry in your brush and you can sort of have that effect. Okay, so let's go back over here. And I think the bag is mostly brown and uh, tan and we've got the presents. So I think let's do the presents first so we can have a bit more fun. And again, I'll come back and do the, uh, the cuff and stuff and everything here later because if we do this now, then we're just going to end up not uh, doing something that's a bit more fun. So let's do that up here. Cat wants to know, Hajra, if you can't recall what was sketched, are you referring to a photo? Yeah, I'm looking at the uh, the original master study digitally on my computer. It's behind the, the painting back there, you know, up she over if, that if way. if we can see it, but I don't think there's any way for you to really show it to me. You can just look for this uh, study. You can just look for the study. It's a 1931 Haddon Sunblom Santa. It'll be the one with the reindeer in the door and bag of presents on the ground. We're not doing the doorway or the reindeer. We're doing, uh, you know, the bag of presents and him standing here because it's uh, supposed to be an instructive, fast study. So, um, but yeah, that's what I'm looking at. And you'll be able to... It's the 1931 one. I think you can look for it. All right, so I'm trying to figure out where to... I think we should do the presents, right? think they're more fun. They're not, you can't really see much of anything. You can see an airplane. I think the edge of a bear there and I don't know if that's a doll. There's definitely a drum of some sort. Again that uh, sketch is really not holding up well so we're gonna have to freehand draw that in. All right so let's see. Um, 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 um. You found it? Okay so I think you put the link in the in the chat so you can open up the link to the, the piece and I'm just trying to figure out uh, I think I'll put in the stains first. Let's uh, let's uh, that way it'll make people a little bit more certain about what's going on on the actual page and uh, me being one of those people. <laughs> and so let's get this, uh, actually let's get the bigger brush out so that we can get this going faster. And I'd say that I can see yellow for the sack and um, Kat, you can look at that reference now in the uh, in the chat. But I'm just trying to put all of this in. And there's definitely areas here that I feel like have lighter highlights. But once this fades back and you put the darker color in, this will actually look fine. But um, let me put a local color stain here now. So whether you do tiling or mid-tone, you can also start with a stain, a local color stain. So that's definitely what I'm doing here. There's going to give me some clarity. So that's where the sack ends. And then over on top of here, I think, is where... There's a little slip of that sack still showing. Over here, I think there's a belt uh, that's basically the belt of with bells on it. I think there's like a little sash or something like that. And then over there, the, the bag is continuing into the background right there. It's going to be heavily in shadow, but I think it comes up to about... I mean, I'm trying to guesstimate with my paint here. It comes up to like right there, and I think it sort of ends to right there. Again, totally useless faded pencil drawing underneath there from a few years back. But let's guesstimate that it ends around right here based off of the uh, reference that I'm looking at. My sketch. Uh, typically if I have an original piece and it's not a master study though, I have a separate sketch. So that way if it ever fades or um, I screw something up, I can, you know, reuse my sketch for another painting. Um, so, you know, that's definitely something I would advise is don't have your only sketch on your... <laughs> on your painting, um, it could get ruined and you might not 
be able to reclaim that. And, you know, as I got older, I, I've been doing that for all my original paintings, for sure, is having a separate sketch. And it takes up time, sure, yeah, of course, but it makes it so that when you come back to it, you're not feeling like if you ruin it, it's the only version. So it actually gives you a sense of relief and freedom while you're painting as well, you know? So it can definitely help you out with that. When you're painting cloth or texture like this, this leather with a bag, mm -hmm. does the direction of your strokes matter very much? Do um, you try to follow the direction of, of the... It does. You, um, not for the stain, but mm -hmm. for when it gets thicker. When it's super thick, it doesn't matter. When it's super thick and when it's super thin, it's just going to uh, not matter because the thin one is going to get covered up and the super thick part just looks like the one texture. But whenever you're doing something that actually has texture that's visible, like this area or his beard or everything like that, all of these are directional contouring strokes, right? So they're like rendering the form and following cil cylinders in the form or following other contours in the form. So yeah, definitely you want to do that. Um, whenever you can for situations where you feel like the texture is going to show. Now, when it's going to be really thin like a stain like this, then it doesn't matter. Um, I still put it in the direction of the form habitually because I'm still sort of trying to draw the form um, with the paint versus the pencil. So I'm still sort of habitually following the textures in the same directions. But yeah, definitely where it matters is where the texture is visible. So when you get just fully, fully opaque, like we did with the background for that line decker lady, and remember, you can put it in in any direction and that dark blue in the background wasn't showing up, right? It wasn't showing up as a texture because it was just a super dark, opaque blue. So it's not going to matter if you get past a opacity, but if you're going to create textures and you want to make sure that you're they're following the contouring of the form. Okay, so this bear here, we don't quite know what color he is. I don't even know if he's a bear. Does that look like a bear to you or does that look like a... It's almost like a... I don't know. Yeah, he looks almost like a badger, but he could also be a bear. But he's barely showing up, so okay, and so down here... Pun? He's barely showing up? Mm-hmm, barely. Barely, barely. All right, so down here, there seems to be a lot of uh, base tone for ochre around here, for sure. So I think this is the doll's head with the hair. Nicole Knox says she has so much to learn. Well, there's always going to be more to learn because it's, um, you know, the universe and the world is infinite. And so that goes for subjects and styles. about the class you're about to teach, maybe? Yeah, you can learn all these gouache styles in the class on the weekend. But what I'm saying is, is that don't ever be intimidated by the fact that you've got a lot to learn. Because, you know, I've been painting for, um, you know, 10 years and I've also been uh, drawing for like 20 or 25. You know, I've been drawing since I was a little kid and um, and I've still learn more all the time. So I think that the whole idea of keeping yourself curious and healthy to be able to learn is a great part of being able to continue to learn. It's like in order to be receptive to the learning in the first place, be comfortable with the fact that you've got a lot to learn and revel in it, rejoice in it, and don't be like, you know, unhappy about it. Because um, a lot of people say, oh my God, I'll never catch up. I've got so much to learn. It's like, actually, that's actually a lot of the most exciting parts are when you actually have to learn stuff, you know? It gets less exciting when you have less to learn. Then you just have to sort of figure out what subjects are you painting, um, you know, what style you have, and, you know, what you want to focus on. Actually, some of the more most fun parts are the parts where you do have to learn, you know? I'm not saying it can't be frustrating at times, but it's definitely also the most exciting as far as a journey. Um, okay, so that those are the, the sacks over there. I feel like down here, there's definitely shadows over here. I can sort of build up the sash and everything from there. I'm trying to think if there's any other color I really want to toss in. I see like this bluish, grayish plain color on the, on the plane and also on these skates. Looks like there's a skate hanging out of the side of this bag. And we didn't use any blue in this piece, so I'm not going to introduce a separate blue color. I did use a little bit of green. And I'm trying to figure out what green that was. It's this green right here that was barely in the holly that we're going to have to touch up. I believe it was this green. So I think what I'm going to mix up a little bit of shadow into that by making it blue. And since we don't have blue and red would make it brown, I'm going to mix some black into it. And hopefully that'll give me... So this is the only palette I have that has all the colors I own in a brand in it. That's why I call it my dream palette. <laughs> and which brand is this? This is the Crater Color Aqua Sticks and Aqua Brick. So it actually has all the colors that are um, in the set because all my other uh, palettes only have limited color schemes out on them at any given time. But this um, palette has, let me think, I think this, is this the green? Or these both look like the same green and they just went down to different colors, but it looks like it's the same green. I think it might even have been this one. It doesn't matter really because it will look rather similar. But yeah, the gouache colors I have are more limited. So as a result of that, I can have them all out in a palette. And I always wanted to have like one of those big palettes. In fact, I did, but I gave it away because I never used it. It was a really big palette and um, had a lot of wells in it, like in the border. You know, the way you see somebody like Sterling Edwards set it up. 
but I didn't end up ever doing that because I always use limited palettes so I don't want all my colors out at the same time. So I got this palette at some point that had all these little wells because I like small wells and small palettes and stuff like that because of how I paint. And it did fit all my gouache colors in the border so I have them in a spectral order and the ones in the middle are just the, the blends like, you know, uh, or a low earthy color like the ochre. Um, it's not, I don't think it fits like um, every every single color, but just about every color. So I think pretty much all the colors. All right, so that's a more bluish color. Let me see if I like that. Let's put that down on something. Maybe right here. I think that's a good plain color. You see how it looks like that airplane? So that's what I was going for. And again, if you can do that without having to mess with putting down um, a new color, like a new blue or something, that's better for you because you don't want to have too many colors. You know, I already have six colors out in this and I do not want to have even more colors out. So let's put this down. Again, as a local stain for that plane. And I'm probably going to come back and recapture highlights. I could have retained them if I was painting it at home. Um, live is different than painting for me at home, so I consider even though I'm at home right now. Um, but anyway, this weekend, speaking of teaching classes, we'll be doing those four foxes, one in watercolor, one in watercolor that's dense and plus white and, and intense and also in gouache. So we'll be doing four little foxes and learning all the different techniques for painting those things. And, you know, it'll be a lot of fun if you want to join me. And it's only $15 and you can sign up via secure PayPal or credit card off of my YouTube community page. And I'm looking into um, putting my classes onto Amazon as well. So it's going to take a little while because Amazon's way more rigorous and takes much longer. But uh, I'm going to end up, you know, putting some of them hopefully onto Amazon as well over the long term because like I said I'd really want to have those classes there for people who want to learn and have these questions but I'm not forever doing new videos so I think I'm going to show up every now and again and do um, you know maybe some challenges or collaborations with people or um, some classes but apart from that I'm going to semi-retire my channel because like I said I've, I've got almost 300 videos up and I've been on YouTube for like five years and for me that's enough I've kind of um, lost interest and I want to do my picture books and all those other things. But I'm definitely going to, you know, post those classes every now and again because they're fun for me to teach and also good for people to learn. All right, so I'm going to get a little bit of that black now and I'm going to try to figure out how to now start sculpting this um, this plane, right? So the, the other things I can do is when you do a really light paint, you can definitely sketch in the gouache the way you would with a pencil because you can always come back and make stuff darker. So as long as you keep it really light, it's easy to sculpt with it. And even with that transparent gouache or translucent gouache, you can lift up, you know, it's liftable. So if you want to reclaim highlights later, you can do that too. Okay, so I'm trying to get that plane. There's a drum here, and I think that this goes off onto this angle here. So I'm trying to paint negatively around the drum now up to right there. And that's the shadow of the bag. And so let's go ahead and work on the plane now. That's the pure black that I've got a little bit of green mixed into. Looks like some kind of little... World War bomber type plane. It's gonna be a World War One plane for sure here. But I love gouache. It's so velvety feeling, and it just makes you feel like you didn't have to give up um, the mastery of something like an oil paint just because you don't want to deal with the fumes or you're allergic or you know the cleanup because it's a, a huge amount of cleanup too when you're working with oil paints and you know not to mention the chemicals now this drum that comes around the corner also cuts off that part of the plane so I'm going to make sure I fix that you know later on I'm just going to denote it right now without adding more color that that's the form of the drum I'm trending right there but always fix your ellipses by the end of it it doesn't matter if you've got sloppy ellipses part of the way in but definitely fix your ellipses and your circles and the accuracy of them by the time you're done and nothing makes something look worse as a professional piece, um, if the circles and ellipses or hands and faces and feet are off, you know? Those are all things you have to focus on, unfortunately. And, you know, and just, you know, slow and steady. Practice and practice and that'll get you there. All right, so that's the uh, shadow on this side of the plane here. And what I'm gonna do now is um, come over onto this side and get, try to figure out which part of this line that I wanna straighten out, I think. We'll get, this part and just bring it out a bit more.
And it has like a highlight that's catching down the side too, so I can see numerous ones and I can't catch them all right now, but I can come back later and work on them. And um, do a little bit more of that shading down the side here. Is there a reason why you started with the airplane? It just looked interesting. I felt like it was going to be interesting in comparison to other stuff that people were seeing so far, you know, because we did see me do the boots and uh, a little bit of that sack, and I just thought the airplane is a, an interesting toy to start with. Meld it in. Get a little bit of that white there. And that's just uh, magic to make it look like metal, you know, it'll make it look like metal in a way that you couldn't possibly do. I mean, it, gouache on paper, when you make it semi-translucent, has that pebbly look to it. It's very distinctive, it's quite attractive, but I still don't prefer it to um, full opacity. And you'll see people um, like uh, comic book artist Paulo Rivera, or um, and he's working in a closer tradition to somebody like Alex Ross, where some of it is more transparent. Um, I prefer to do it the oil painting way and the golden age way, which is to make all of it um, more opaque, you know, because I feel like, again, if I want to work transparent, then I've got my watercolor for that. And I'm, I'm really good at painting with watercolor too. So I don't have to sacrifice only knowing, you know, um, doing one way or the other, because I'm only doing one medium. So in my case, I definitely do want to benefit from being able to do a full opacity treatment of the gouache because other people um, are not doing that and I feel like they're missing out the fun for some of it you know if they're doing that because I mean not to say that you can't if you only got one set it's just gouache then you can use it transparently and opaque but I do happen to have both sets and that's the point which is that if I have both sets then I'm going to use my gouache opaque and if I want a transparent piece then I'll use my watercolor instead. Okay so you can see how that's slowly been starting to build up and with the drawing with the lighter paint. And that's how you draw. If you like, say you forget your pencil, your drawing's gone or whatever, draw it really light in the paint, really light. That way you can correct and lift a bit. And then after that, you can come in darker and essentially you just end up being able to then use your, your brush as your pencil because you've drawn it. See, just like I'm doing this now, very light and then come back and sort of work around it and correct for whatever it is that I'm doing, you know? turn it into the shape I want. Brace with a pencil, you can kind of do the same thing with the, the paint, you know, um, especially gouache. Gouache is very amenable to that. And put in a little bit more white there to make those highlights sing, because, you know, there's a metallic body to this plane. Well, that's, at least that's what I'm hoping, because, you know, this is back before the days of endless plastic everything. So we're going to have a, a nice amount of Highlight. Cat says great color on the plane, and Heather says I have also learned that using my watercolor under my colored pencil pieces helps with my hand fatigue. Right, because it'll fill up a lot of those blanks for you, right? So yeah, that's a great idea too. I don't use color pencil at all because it's too hard on my hands. Um, but if you did use color pencil, then supplementing it with a, a paint or a watercolor fill is going to be helpful because then you won't have to worry about just relying on the color pencil to fill up all those gaps, you know, so. All right, I'm trying to figure out where I want this plane to start and stop, so let's try to give that. It's really not very clear from the original reference. It's kind of a mushy. It is, but I think I can pretty much get an idea where he was going with it. Yeah. It's, it seems pretty clear to me. I think, but it, well, the only thing it means for me is that I wanted to move the highlight further up because basically this part's the part that's swallowed up. And then I'm going to come back in with the uh, the highlight because I think that's what I was realizing, which is I like the highlight where it was, but it didn't do what I wanted for the form. So it just means I have to come back. Destroy that highlight where it is and come back in and put it in. And... So in this case, I want it to be further up the body here, just like that. And then two strokes in this way. And that'll make it more into the plane that I want it to look like. And again, let's give it a few areas else where I said I wanted that. Up there on the cusp of that plane there. And then also 
down here and I think it really makes it read more like a... It almost looks like a whale, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. The body of it. Okay, and there's also, before I wash the white out, there are the, the drum areas where the drum is going to end up having those things that the drum is decorated with and like wrapped with. And so I'm going to go in and put those in because those are definitely in the uh, painting, but uh, they were covered up with the plain shadow. So I'm going to go and put those in so that when I come back later, I have a place for them with the ochre. Okay, and now let's get a little bit of that darker brown shadow. I think you're getting close to when your meeting time is showing up, right? That's correct. Okay, so I have a hard three o'clock deadline today. I really would have preferred it if I could have just kept going for another hour. Today was one of those days where I just basically feel like... Painting? Yeah. And, uh, and nothing's hurting yet, you know? Well, if you want, you could come back later in the day. No, I'm not going to set up a different stream. It'll be in a separate video and everything, so that's not really what I wanted to do. But it just makes me a little bit annoyed because I wish I could have just continued to do it on here, but if you got a meeting, so you got a meeting. What can we do? But um, I'm going to go ahead and finish this part out and then now take the part here where I know that this is going to be a brown shadow in the bag and just extend it over this way. Okay, this is where we're sort of carving out negatively now where the the doll's head is and where he's sort of starting out that part of it but yeah I'll definitely post the the finished piece on Instagram but this is a lot of fun and you can kind of see exactly I mean between the two boots the legs the the muff the plane and some of the sack you can see where okay. call it quits and I think just let me know whenever it is I have to to do that you can see a little bit of a divot in the sack here. Again, a lot of keep your angles sharp on a lot of these things. Or a lot of people lose the the angles on fabric folds, and they make them too rounded. Are there any more comments there? People are talking about pastels and chalk pastels versus color pencils, oil pastels, chalk pastels, and things like that. Cat and Heather are talking about them. That's nice. Kat was saying that she likes her chalk pastels on black paper because it gives it a big pop. Yeah, I used to have pastels, and again, it's one of those things that I don't use anymore because it's uh hurts my hands too much. But it's a fun tool to use. I used to use my pastels for marbling. I did a video on that, showing that as well. And that's the. Uh, this is a. A skate that's hanging, I think, out mm -hmm. of the... Uh, that's what it looks like. Yeah, it's like a skate hanging out of the side of the... How many boots you got in this painting? Yeah, no, he's not... This is not one of his boots. It doesn't have three legs. That's one problem he doesn't have yet. <laughs> he might be missing finger bones, but he doesn't have um, extra... Oh, back to the finger bones. Not to, not to restart it as a topic, but just to say this is not his boot. Okay, so we got that, and... And you'll use that grayed green for the metal, for the for the blade. Oh, yeah, yeah, totally. No, that's the, I mean, you, once you've got um, a limited color scheme, you do not want to remove yourself from those colors and add even more colors. You might think you're doing yourself a favor and getting a color easier, but really all that ends up happening is you end up um, making the piece not harmonious and um, not as professional looking and not as sort of... Uh, the colors and I'm gonna continue to draw this in and paint. I think I'll try to finish that before we head out. This is gonna get covered up with a red, I think, because that's gonna be a a red belt sash thingy over there. But that's the nice thing about gouache, it is opaque, so you can totally do that. But this is what I would have done in uh, pencil, but you know, like I said, if you can do it in paint, then there's really no reason to to do it in pencil the whole way. It's just gonna, you know, you're gonna end up covering it up anyway. But also on top of that, it's not that difficult. It really isn't that difficult to uh, just treat your paint like it's a pencil. Just uh, c get comfortable wielding your brush, and after a while, it'll just start to feel like you're sketching with your 
And just don't make the paint too wet, you know? If the paint's super wet, then you're not going to be able to treat it like it's a pencil, obviously. Looks like he's got a lot of these. I love these sleigh bell balls. So there's nothing like these little jingle bell balls totally. that make you feel like Christmas. Like, ah, uh, I love Christmas season. I miss it. I wish it was Christmas right now. I think, because um, I'm a winter baby myself, so I think between Halloween, Thanksgiving, Christmas, uh, New Year's, and then my birthday, and your birthday too, because your birthday is in October, I think all of our, all of our nice, uh, fun, most of our nice fun things happen um, during the, the fall and winter season, particularly the winter season, I think. All right, well, you better say your goodbyes to your peoples. Oh man. Tell them about the upcoming class. Tell them what they're going to learn in this class. Do your meetings. You're in your quarantine meetings. Tell them what they're going to learn in their fox class. Can't you just cancel it? <laughs> Tell them what, you're gonna, what they're going to learn in their upcoming class. Okay. The what, when is the fox class? It's this weekend on uh, Saturday, so from 12 to 3. Um, so while I'm talking about it, I'm going to continue to paint. <laughs> There's a, a, a gouache class that's color gouache ink tents and also uh, so two types of watercolor using it dense and also using it with white because people have asked me how they can make uh, gouache effects basically with different mediums so we're going to be painting a fox four different ways using four different mediums on two different types of watercolor paper and you can sign up for that class for just $15 on my community page the link is there it's also probably around here someplace because he's been pasting it and um, it's just going to be a lot of fun to do all of that because we're going to do that fox and be able to understand the differences between these mediums that a lot of people I think are still confused by you know um, I've been trying all the time I've been on YouTube to differentiate. I think it doesn't help that a lot of people show up and say all the wrong things about watercolor or gouache or something or even intense and it, it ha happens a lot. You know, somebody will show up and they're not an expert. They're just trying to make a video that gets views and um, they think they're doing something fun and helpful and I'm not saying that people shouldn't be able to have fun but I wish people wouldn't make stuff that's inaccurate and because it leaves other people who are searching for it to sometimes be confused. But anyway, we'll be doing those four different things, and that's what we're going to be working on is those foxes. And then the weekend after that, we'll be painting a gouache car in the Zorn palette and learning metal, uh, glass, dirt, and rubber textures in this realistic gouache car that's a, a chimney, old chimney sweep car from the early 1900s. And it's based off of a photo that uh, one of my friends, who is a, a great cabinet maker, um, Paul Murphy, he took that photo. And so we'll be using that, and it'll be an exciting project, so... That's everything, and I guess I better wrap this up. And thanks to everybody for purging your brushes here. Um, if you didn't have a meeting, then I would definitely stay on and try to work on this a bit more. But until next time, I'll wishing you guys all um, epic art adventures, and I guess I better stop this thing. But hopefully you guys enjoyed what I posted so far.